Finally, we continue our look back 75 years ago to the final months of World War II. This is a story about a man who had an important job here at home, and he didn't have to serve, but he just couldn't stop himself. And his family and his congregation, they couldn't stop him either. Ferdinand Isserman was 43 years old when the U.S. entered World War II. He'd been the rabbi at Temple Israel for 12 years and was a leading voice for social justice. He was one of the giants uh, of the rabbinical community in St. Louis when these were larger than life-size figures. And he was uh, several stories above those people in, in that he was very much interested in fostering uh, interfaith relations throughout his entire rabbinic career. When the U.S. entered the war, Rabbi Isserman, who had served in the U.S. Army in World War I but never went overseas, would not have been called into service in this war because of his age, his family, and his job. And while he was needed at home in so many ways, he felt he had to do more. So he volunteered to serve six months in the American Red Cross, serving American troops overseas. All right. Well, this, so. was, this was important to him. I mean, oh, he... quite. Yeah. Mementos of those years are at the St. Louis Jewish Community Archives. It's not something he had to do. Oh, no, you know, not at he, all, uh, not at all. So these are, he kept these, and obviously it meant something to him. Right. When people hold on to things for decades, it means that it meant something strongly to him. Right. I believe this is actually in one of the photographs we'll show you. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Isserman wrote a book about his experiences and said joining the Red Cross gave him a chance to do what he hadn't done in World War I, serve his country at a battlefront. He, among many, thought that they had missed out yeah. on things, and therefore they wanted to serve uh, any way they could. But there was more to it than that. The enemy was Nazi Germany, and Isserman, in his own way, had been fighting the Nazis for years. He actually visited, and this took tremendous courage for a Jewish rabbi to visit Nazi Germany in 1933, 34, and 35. And each time he came back, he not only gave a sermon at Temple Israel, but at various churches throughout the community. And there were newspaper articles about what All he was over saying. The place. Yeah. It wasn't just the marching and the flags. Americans could see that in the newsreels. Isserman spoke about what was happening to real people how German Jews, adults, and children were being isolated, ostracized, beaten, arrested, their livelihoods ruined, with nowhere to turn. There were those in St. Louis who wrote rebuttals disputing his reports and defending the new German regime and its policies towards Jews. So he wrote, um, sentenced to death the Jews in Nazi Germany um, in 1933. This is after his first trip. Right. Um, so this one's in a little um, delicate condition. Yeah. Felt strongly enough that he thought that there needed to be as much information out there as possible, which is why he went to Germany in the first place. It wasn't until years later that it became clear just how tragically accurate his pamphlet title had been. Temple Israel granted their rabbi a leave of absence in early 1943 so he could volunteer for the Red Cross. After training, he was shipped to North Africa where Allied troops were fighting the German army and preparing for the invasion of Sicily. He began his work in the city of Oran, Algiers. He did not, though, go as a rabbi. The American Red Cross was non-denominational and it did not have chaplains, but the U.S. Army soon began to ask him to conduct services for Jewish GIs, sometimes at their graves, but usually for groups large and small for Sabbath and holiday services. He actually had a Torah scroll that he kept in a postal bag, so detailed in the book, and he kept it with him at all times. And when there was an interfaith service, they would have a Catholic and a Protestant chaplain. And then he got up there, there would not be a rabbi present, so he would fulfill that function and he would unfurl the Torah scroll and all the Jewish servicemen said, we feel so blessed to have somebody acknowledge that we have a, our own uh, sacred text. His Red Cross duties involved working with what were called Red Cross girls, serving coffee and donuts, and providing centers for recreation and relaxation. 
But Rabbi Isserman's real contribution during his time in North Africa was starting up and hosting a lecture series about world events for American servicemen. It was called the Red Cross Town Hall. At first, it was just for officers, but Isserman felt it was just as important to reach the enlisted men as well. And I think he wanted them to widen their horizons and get them to know more about what's going on in the world, in the war. This is Bizzurti Harbor, just before the Sicilian invasion. Isserman was concerned that American GIs seemed to understand why we were fighting Japan, but were less eager to invade Europe and fight the Germans. He believed German soldiers were dedicated to their cause, but that too many Americans just wanted to win and go home. He feared that even if Germany were defeated, anti-Semitism would thrive and that Hitler could lose the war, but still win. Isserman asked popular war correspondent Ernie Pyle to be the first town hall speaker, but Pyle, who was as brave as anyone on the battlefield, said he just froze in front of crowds, but he thought the town hall was a great idea and talked other correspondents into appearing. The Red Cross town halls became quite popular and took up much of Isserman's time. He was kind of a workaholic. Those town halls were not just something he wanted to do for amusement, it was an obsession. In his book, Rabbi Isserman wrote about race issues in the military and the treatment of African-American GIs. He also discussed what was then called battle fatigue in psychiatric and mental health terms, long before we called it PTSD. He was shipped back to the States in the fall of 1943. And when he got home to St. Louis, he addressed nearly a thousand people in his uniform talking about the need to support the troops here on the home front and how important it was for them to get letters from home. There were those who no doubt thought Isserman's Red Cross service was unnecessary, but he was in a position to do what he wanted. He had respect, he had the power, and no small ego. His ego sometimes got in the way of making room for other people. He took his leave of absence, left his congregation and his family, missed his son's confirmation and his 20th wedding anniversary, but he did get close to the front, within range of artillery fire and air attacks. Was he being selfless or self-indulgent, do you think, Both. When he did this? Both. There's yeah. a, a, tri a triad of expressions in the Jewish community. Hillel, the great rabbi after whom all the college Jewish organizations is named, he was a sage that around the time of Jesus of Nazareth, and he said, if I'm not for myself, then who will be for me? starts off with something that's essentially selfish. Second thing is, if, I'm, if I am for myself alone, then what am I? And he deliberately uses a what instead of a who. And the third one, if not now, when? And he did not want to let World War II pass uh, without serving his country in some way. So uh, it was a patriotic thing to do. And his book is just uh, loaded with patriotic references, that are some of which are quite moving. Most of these are images of him at Temple Israel. Right. Ferdinand Isserman was rabbi when Temple Israel moved from Holy Corners to follow its congregation to the county, and he served as senior rabbi until 1963. But Isserman wasn't done making news. In 1964, he raised eyebrows and some disapproval when he decided to run for state representative, challenging and losing in the primary to incumbent Ken Rothman who would become Missouri's first Jewish Speaker of the House and Lieutenant Governor. Isserman passed away in 1972 at the age of 74. The Post-Dispatch obituary called him a leader in interfaith and interracial movements. It talked about how he established the first interracial nursery school in the city, his work helping juvenile delinquents, his honorary degrees, his radio shows, his world travel, his run for office, his visits to Nazi Germany in the 1930s. There were so many things, they had to leave some things out. And there was no mention of his six months in North Africa with the American Red Cross. Yeah, clearly he was, he was proud of his Absolutely, service. absolutely. 